We started talking about inflammation and tissue repair last quarter in pathophysiology, and we're going to continue to talk about that and about pain theory. So the same themes continue throughout. We're just going to add a little bit of nuance to it with regard to physical agents. So um, for the learning objectives, I want you to be able to describe three key features of each stage of tissue repair, inflammation, proliferation, and maturation, and associate the above three stages of tissue repair with their clinical signs and general PT interventions. So nobody walks in the clinic with a sign around their neck that says, I'm in the inflammatory phase, <laughs> but you should be able to identify um, things in the three stages that um, will clue you in so you know what phase they're in a and they won't need the sign. Um, you should be able to describe the importance and effects of macrophages in healing tissue. We know macrophages had a big role in the immune system and they also have a big role in tissue healing. Um, the delays um, in local and systemic healing um, and the, the influences that local and systemic factors have in healing and the primary determinants of the outcome of it, any tissue injury and the healing abilities of different tissue types and the factors affecting the healing of each. And that's going to be important for choosing the appropriate PT interventions. So lots of different um, practitioners treat inflammatory conditions. And um, we, as rehabilitation professionals, a lot of times that's what we're working on. And the we're treating inflammatory conditions that result from trauma, um, surgical procedures, problematic healing sometimes. Um, the treatments that we're using are often um, therapeutic exercises and manual techniques are kind of the wheelhouse. And then physical agents are gonna help us apply those other techniques. So physical agents are used in the treatment of inflammatory conditions and we will explore how they're used. So the timeline of the phases of inflammation and repair, um, obviously these phases vary in duration from person to person and they often overlap. So it's not like, Okay, today the inf inflammation process, inflammation phase stops and the proliferation phase begins. It's not how it works, they overlap. So the inflammation phase prepares the wound for healing and it usually lasts from one to six days. Um, usually. <laughs> the prolifer uh, pr proliferation phase rebuilds damaged structures and strengthens the wound. And that can be anywhere from day three to 20. So the early part of the injury, and that's usually when we're seeing people. Um, the maturation phase modifies the scar tissue into its mature form, and that's from day nine onward. So we're seeing people during the early part of the maturation phase. Um, and again, it's going to differ from person to person. But we'll be able to look at, especially um, people with surgical wounds and other scarring, you can look at the scar and kind of tell what phase they're in from looking at the scar. It's pretty cool. So they don't need that sign around their neck. So during the inflammation phase, um, inflammations from the Latin word in, inflammare, which means to set on fire. Um, it, so redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function are classic um, signs of inflammation that we talked about last quarter. Um, it begins when the normal physiology of the tissue is altered by disease or trauma. So our body has sort of limited responses and one of the responses it can do it can say oh send fluid send fluid to the area send cells to the area so, you know respond to those chemical messengers so um inflammation is an attempt to destroy dilute or isolate cells or agents that may be at fault but it's also necessary for healing so inflammation is the first stage of healing we need it for to uh, initiate the proper healing response. Um, if it's allowed to go on too long, remember it's like one to six days, it can become inappropriate and chronic, such as in autoimmune diseases, which have chronic inflammation, and they can um, cause excessive damage um, or scarring. So that's never good. So 
Inflammation is important for healing, but there's such a thing as too much of a good thing. So the physiological responses during the inflammation phase, so these are the three things from the learning objectives. The vascular response, the hemostatic response, and the cellular response. So the vascular response is swelling and redness. It's mediated by histamines and bradykinins and prostaglandins, um, the chemical messengers that bring blood to the area and dilate capillaries and do all that stuff. So we have that vascular response. That's the change in the capillaries. The hemostatic response controls blood loss when the vessels are damaged. So um, that's our clotting response, our hemostatic response. Um, and vasoconstriction also. Um, cellular response is when the leukocytes migrate to the site to clear er the area of debris. And that cellular response sets the stage for tissue repair. So that's pretty important. And remember, the capillaries have to get more permeable so the leukocytes can get out into the um, interstitial space and do their job, right? So, and there's also an immune response. So even though I said, I want you to know three stages, there's a fourth. Um, immune, the immune response activates neutrophils, which remember are general macrophages and other infection um, fighting cells. And it activates the complement system of the immune system. So that immune response is important if you have debris or um, even debris from dead cells that needs to be cleaned up. So that immune response, and it's a non-specific immune response usually, um, just our macrophages and neutrophils out there clear in the clear in the way for healing. So during the proliferation phase, there are four things that are happening at once to cover the wound and strengthen the injury site. So these um, these four processes are concurrently happening. They're happening at the same time. Um, epithelialization which is um, the creation of new cells, collagen production, which produces granulation tissue. And it's initially type three collagen, which is a weaker type of collagen um, and wound contraction and neovascularization, which is the formation of new blood vessels. So um, you have to close up that wound. You have to cover the wound and strengthen the injury site. You'll be able to tell when people are in the proliferation phase because um, you're going to see that um, pink new scar tissue. So it's type three collagen. It's not as strong as it's eventually going to be. And the formation of new blood vessels makes it pink. So when you look at a new scar, like a new surgical scar, we get to look a lot of scars in physical therapy. So um, you'll see scars. It's very interesting. I love it. But <laughs> the new scar is pink. It's that neovascularized epithelial tissue. And that's one way that we tell we're into the proliferation phases. We see that stuff. A mature scar turns white because it replaces type 3 collagen with type 1 collagen. So during the maturation phase, it's the longest phase, and it can persist more than a year after injury. So your scar tissue is still remodeling long time after your injury. And a lot of um, what we can do is we can teach people to manage their scar so they can have a better, more flexible scar. Um, the Basically, during the maturation phase, the body's trying to restore the injured tissue to its prior function as much as possible. Um, there is, a, during the maturation phase, a there should be a balanced synthesis and lysis of collagen. Um, it, re, that's required for the normal remodeling of the scar. So if production of collagen is greater than the lysis of collagen, you get hypertrophic or keloid scars. So you're making more collagen than you're breaking down. High oxygen exposure um, favors hypertrophy of scar tissue. Um, so type during the maturation phase, type three collagen is replaced by the stronger type one collagen. And that's your mature scar. It's, it's smaller, it's white instead of pink, um, and it's stronger. So chronic inflammation is, um, usually acute inflammation is no more than two weeks. Subacute is more than four weeks and chronic can last for months or years. So chronic inflammation can arise from the persistence of an injuring agent or cumulative trauma, 
or interference of normal normal healing processes for lots of different reasons. So um, imagine that you have a uh, like a splinter in your hand, a big one <laughs> that you can't get out. And um, so you can get chronic inflammation around that splinter site until it's finally removed and, and the tissue is resolved. Uh, <clears throat> with chronic inflammation, you can get increased scarring and adhesions, and it reduces the strength and functional mobility of the tissue. So you would like avoiding chronic inflammation is a good thing, but um, it's not always easy to do. Treating things as soon as possible is a good way to avoid chronic inflammation. So um, there are lots of factors that affect the healing processes. They can be local factors, to local to the injury, or they can be external factors. So local factors include the type, size, and location of the injury. Um, if it's in an, if the wound gets infected, um, infection counts for about 50% of the complications of wound healing. Um, or if it has the vascular supply is compromised in any way that can affect healing. Um, external factors um, can include the therapeutic use of physical agents. So cryotherapy, thermotherapy, therapeutic ultrasound, electromagnetic radiation, light, electrical currents, and mechanical pressure have all been used in attempts to modify the healing process. Um, too much early movement may delay healing, but continuous passive motion in conjunction with short-term immobilization may be helpful. Continuous passive motion is another one of those things that goes in and out of favor. It's been out of favor for about the last 15 years, and who knows, it might come back in. <laughs> we'll see. See. So there are systemic factors that affect the healing process. Obviously, age is a factor. Um, children heal fast. A lot of times children don't need physical therapy for like a, an orthopedic injury. Remember when you were a kid and you broke your leg at gymnastics camp or whatever, um, you were in a cast for six weeks and then you were fine. You just went back to camp, right? Um, for older people, older than children, um, they may need therapy to recover their function. Um, so we're, we don't see if children have multiple injuries or if they have other things going on, they might need therapy, but we generally don't see children in therapy for orthopedic injuries because they don't need us. They heal fast on themselves. Um, if you have any kind of disease processes going on, like diabetes, immune system problems, or vascular system problems, that can impair healing. Um, certain medications can impair healing, like um, corticosteroids, if you're on corticosteroid for some other thing. Um, some medications can enhance healing like insulin to optimize blood sugar control. Um, because of the systemic effects of medications, it can impair or enhance healing depending on what it is. Um, nutrition is important for healing. You need the necessary fuel for inflammation and repair. So we'll talk about this in, um, pathophysiology this quarter when we talk about the digestive system, but after surgery, for example, after orthopedic surgery, people need more protein and they need it spaced out throughout the day. Um, so they have the, the protein to make the collagen to um, heal their injuries. So um, we'll talk about how much they need and when they need to do it in pathophysiology. So do you remember healing by primary, secondary intention <laughs> from patho? Well, here it is again. So um, he healing by primary intention, I told you this stuff would come back, um, is the healing of an incised wound by first intention. Um, so healing by first intention or primary intention um, includes injury and inflammation, and the injury is usually a sterile surgical injury. Um, granulation and epithelial growth and a small scar remains. Um, healing by second intention or secondary intention, there's injury and inflammation. You have granulation and epithelial tissue, um, which has to be bigger because it's a broader, um, less approximated scar edges, and a large scar remains. And the scar itself um, contracts by the um, 
the uh, picture frame theory of wound contraction. So it doesn't, um, like with an incised scar that's sutured together, um, it heals, you know, pretty easily. Um, a um, bigger scar that's healing by secondary intention, the whole thing has to contract in order for the wound to get smaller. And they call it the picture, picture frame theory. It's like zooming in on a picture um, to make it smaller all the way around. It doesn't just edges don't just go together. So different musculoskeletal tissues have different healing capacities. Um, the important determinants of healing include the regenerative capacity of the tissue, and some tissues regenerate better than others, the vascular supply, and the extent of damage. So um, I always say um, circulation equals healing. The more circulation you get, the better you are. But some tissues just have poor vascularization, and so they don't get a lot of circulation. Cartilage is poorly vascularized. It heals the slowest of all these different tissues. Um, tendons and ligaments are variable in their vascularization. So depending on where they are, they heal a little more slowly than skeletal muscle, which is well vascularized, and bone, which is also well vascularized. So circulation equals healing. The ones with better circulation heal better. So cartilage has a limited ability to heal because it lacks lymphatics, blood vessels, and nerves. Cartilaginous injuries that also involve subchondral bone allow inflammatory cells to gain access to repair nearby cartilage. So you're actually better off if it involves the subchondral bone because the cartilage is going to heal better. If it's just the cartilage that's damaged, it's probably not going to heal. Like when you tear your meniscus, sometimes the inner part of the meniscus, they just have to take it out or the outer part. Um, so some of us are walking around with partial menisci or maybe no menisci <laughs> in our knees um, because cartilage has a crappy blood supply and doesn't heal well. Tendons and ligaments have a um, better potential for repair, but it depends on the type of tendon or ligament, the extent of the damage, the vascular supply, of course, and the duration of immobilization. So tendons, because they're attached to skeletal muscles, they possess a unique scar maturation phase can, that can achieve a state of repair close to regeneration. Um, so tendons heal better than ligaments. And cartilage and ligaments heal better than cartilage. We're making a list here. Um, easily controlled, early controlled loading of ligaments promotes healing. So um, yay, that, that goes into our plan for um, including exercise in our rehabilitation or having that be the primary part of our rehabilitation. Skeletal muscle heals great. It can be injured by a lot of things like trauma, strain, muscle diseases, um, healing can occur in some cases through stem cells that can proliferate and differentiate. Muscles um, still have stem cells, and so they you can make new muscles. Isn't that awesome? Sometimes after a severe contusion, you can get a calcified hematoma that's called a, a myositis ossificans, and that heals a little more slowly because the um, calcified part has to dissolve. Um, but that usually is deep muscle trauma that causes that. I've worked with a couple people with those and um, both of them are sports injuries, but they do heal. They just take a long time to heal. Um, bone healing. Oh, bones heal great because they have a great blood supply. And there are four identifiable stages, at least four. Um, inflammation shortly after the impact, it creates a hematoma and disrupts the blood supply and it lowers the pH. Um, a soft callus begins after swelling subsides. It stabilizes the fracture, decreases pain, and reduces the fat, the chances of fat embolism. Um, hard callus is three weeks to four months, and you can see these on the x-ray, which is cool. It corresponds to the clinical healing period. So three weeks to four months is a clinical healing period for a bone fracture. Bone remodeling takes months to years. So healed fibrous bone is, cover, is converted to lamellar bone and the medullary canal becomes patent again, becomes open again. So um, remember our bones are always remodeling and Wolf's Law bones change in response to the stresses you put on them. So loading is important once bone healing is confirmed, protected loading. So um, bones heal great. <laughs> 